host, can I have your attention, please? Hello. Good morning. Thank you. We're going to pray. Thank you, Lord of all nations and races, religions and peoples we gather this morning in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. His spirit and his memory bring us together. We gather in a time of crisis and danger in the world with the sudden war narrowly averted just a week ago. Thank you, Lord, for that. With thousands of refugees uprooted daily, fleeing poverty, desertification and destruction of farmland and violence. Bless them, Lord, with the dangerous confrontation over gun legislation threatened here in Richmond on Monday. The world's conflicts are political, Lord, they're geographical and economic, but they're almost always complicated by our unhealed racial realities. Race and ethnic discrimination infect nearly all of the world's conflicts today, especially here and here in Richmond, where at one time the greatest ideals of human equality were spoken to the world, we still have not yet defeated that ugly demon of racial inequity. Nearly four centuries of intentional discrimination cannot vanish in 50 years, no matter how many true citizens give their hearts and lives for equality. So, Lord, these deep foundations of discrimination are hidden. The foundations are hidden. It's no longer legal to openly discriminate by race, but it is legal to have one school system for the city and another for the counties, and to give less state funding to schools of the concentrated poor. It's still legal to build six and eight lane highways with state funds and have no public transportation on them. It's still true that the median black family wealth in Richmond is less than 10% of the wealth of the white families here. So it's not legalized segregation which we're fighting today, Lord. It's not noticing what keeps things inequitable. It's being so accustomed to our sickness that we don't see how we perpetuate it. It's acting as if these habitual discriminatory structures erected by our ancestors must not be deliberately torn down. Lord, today in this room you brought together many wonderful hearts for forgiveness and tension, fellowship and courage. And from our ancestors, you've given us powerful convictions that we cannot give up on. You've taught us that each of us is important, each of us can learn, and each of us can make a difference. So help us to make that difference today, Lord. Now, 52 years after Dr. King gave his life, help us to be a part of his great congregation, walking and working to make the American dream vital here in Virginia. Help us to tell the truth and to establish justice and not to forget mercy. And as we eat together this morning, Lord, as we eat the food you've so generously provided, help us to befriend each other once again, yet more deeply, to give one another courage so that your kingdom may fully come right here in central Virginia. Thank you, dear God, for this true spirit. Bless this food and bless every person in this room this morning. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our MC for this morning, Senator Jennifer McClellan, who represents the 9th District and is chair of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Commission. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. 
I would like to introduce our head table this morning. They are Diane Leopold, Executive Vice President and CEO for Gas Infrastructure Group, Dominion Energy. Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, Chairman of the Virginia Union University Board of Trustees. Dr. Hakeem J. Lucas, President and CEO of Virginia Union University. The Honorable Ralph Northam, Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Honorable Speaker of the House, Delegate Eileen Fillerporn. The, the Honorable LeVar Stoney, Mayor of the City of Richmond. And the Reverend Ricardo Brown, Executive Director of Living the Dream. Please give a round of applause for our special guest. We have experienced, oh, you may see. <laughs> I didn't know I had that much power. <laughs> we have experienced some significant events in the Commonwealth of Virginia since we last came together for this gathering. We've had some very difficult discussions about race and reconciliation. After 59 years, the arrest records of our beloved Richmond 34 were finally expunged. After they bravely protested racial segregation by staging the sit-in at a downtown lunch counter in 1960. We have a new majority in the General Assembly. For the first time in its 401 year history, a woman is the speaker of the world. And a woman and an African American is the president pro tem of the Senate. We have the most diverse General Assembly we've ever had and a record number of committee chairs who are women and African American. And we witnessed the unveiling of rumors of war, depicting an African American man mounted on a horse, inspired by and reclaiming the image of a Confederate monument. We have a lot to remember and celebrate today. 2019 was a significant year and it moved us forward in a way I think Dr. King would be proud of. You will notice today's program is a little bit different from previous years as we are mindful of your schedule. Our program will end in one hour. You can applaud that. So first we will have Virginia University Concert Choir sing the national anthem and lift every voice and sing. Followed by, uh, our, well you probably will have breakfast served immediately thereafter. Derek sang, okay. <laughs> they, were good. they were so good we want to hear them. Please enjoy your meal this morning as our sponsors' logos roll on the screen. And at this time, we will receive greetings from Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, uh, Chairman and CEO of the Virginia Union Board of Trustees, and the 13th President and CEO of Virginia Union, Dr. Virginia Lewis. Followed by remarks from our presenting sponsor, Dominion Energy, who has supported this breakfast for 42 years, and we are thankful for their generosity. Diane Leopold, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the Gas Infrastructure Group and a member of the Virginia Union Board of Trustees will deliver remarks uh, and we will hear our guests in that order. Good morning. I plan to say that whole hour, but I guess I have to come back now. Let me say that we are at Virginia Union delighted to welcome you to this historic and celebrated event that we've hosted across the years. Let me say that we are, we are gathered this morning by two notions, or three. One, the notion that the Constitution of the United States clearly states and suggests and infers that we would honor that there be equality of value and purpose 
dignity of discourse and affirmation of everybody based on their grounded realities in humanity. That notion informs our coming here today. But that is not the only notion. We are also here because of the notion that one man and a movement decided to hold the nation accountable for its hypocrisy in carrying out the vision of the Constitution. And that movement, the civil rights movement of Dr. Martin Luther King, challenged the behavior and practices of this nation, the practices of discrimination and racism and marginalization and hanging and lynching of indecent behavior and ways in which we uh, diminish people on the basis of uh, difference and diversity. When we fail to live up to the vision that calls us to this land, we do not have to wait for anybody to impeach us. We self-impeach. When we fail to be all that the Constitution calls us to be and lifts our discourse to a higher level, we impeach ourselves as citizens of the United States. Finally, we are called here because of a dream, a dream that things will get better, that the, that the mountains will be made low, the valleys will be exalted, and the crooked places will be made straight. We are called here to participate in that dream and to fulfill that dream, not to have breakfast, not to sing come by high, but to in fact engage ourselves in activities that continues to transform America to realize its potential and vision. So today, Virginia Union University, born in Lumpkin's jail in the shade slave quarters, has called us together together to announce and to affirm our commitment to the dream of a world where all people are celebrated. We have come here, the sons and daughters of the oppressed, and the sons and daughters of the oppressed. We have been called to the table of brotherhood to work out our differences and to join our hands to make this city, this state, and this country a better. And Virginia Union is ready for the task. God bless you and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the 42nd Annual Community Leaders Breakfast, honoring our beloved Martin Luther King Jr. Please put your hands together. Today I have the honor to stand before you and initiate the thanks to all of those who are in the room for this occasion. First, uh, I would like to recognize the Board of Trustees of Virginia University. May all of you present stand, wave. And while we are doing that, uh, we have our control president. You all know him, Dr. Paul Perkins. Please wave your hand. Ms. Perkins. Of course, uh, the honorees, please stand. Uh, Virginia Legis Legislative Black Caucus, all of you, and Chairman Bagby, please. Thank you, Thank you for all that you did. Of course, to our governor, our lieutenant governor, to Speaker of Philip Horn, to uh, Senator Spanberger, uh, to Representative Bobby Scott, and to Senators Mark Warner, Tim Kaine, and Representative Amy Keechan. Uh, to our mayor, uh, you can wave your hand. Uh, thank you for being with us. And more importantly, to reflect the diversity in the room and the celebration of the legacy, uh, we would like to thank 12 corporations, I'll name you all, 12 corporations, 20 community groups, four colleges, three alumni groups, two news and media venues, 30 choir members and 20 student volunteers that have all supported in their own way. Please clap for them. <laughs> Specifically, our presenting sponsor, Dominion Energy, thank you so much. And trust me, will speak be on the path to our platinum sponsor, McGuire Woods. Thank you all for always being supportive. 
To our gold sponsors, Altria Group, CarMax, SunTrust, and Wells Fargo, we appreciate all you do to help us stand on the shoulders of greatness and to, to talk about and to signify the unity that is so much needed in this time and space in our country and our nation and in our city. I want to pause for just a moment to acknowledge a colleague of mine who is also on our battlefield of historically black colleges and universities. He and his wife, they are here, uh, President McCullough Booth. Can you please stand? The illustrious president of Virginia State University. If you don't mind me playing a little event that is coming. Uh, if you want to continue to celebrate uh, MLK in this weekend, on uh, this uh, Saturday, you will see the Virginia Union Panthers defeat Virginia State Trojans uh, at, uh, at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Uh, Ken Johnson is here. He'll give you all the information at the Freedom Classic this weekend. Uh, please come join us. Uh, he might win one or two out of who knows. But what we're going to do is stand together, be excited, and celebrate the greatness of this weekend. So thank you for coming, Greg. I know there's some trolls in the room, so clap for your president. <laughs> All right, 10 seconds, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, Virginia Union University continues to stand in this uh, the sacred moment of time to celebrate the visible unity of all of us in the room today. And once again, this is the realization of Dr. King's dream, a visible unity of people in the community standing together for that which is most sacred, the uplift of us all. And for this, we should also clap one more time. We would not be here, nor would the dream continue to live if it wasn't for the young people, this generation that we dare to educate, train, mentor, and lead. So students, alumni, all of those who have gone to HBCUs, can you please stand and be honored at this moment? You are the dream. You are the living example of everything we stand on. We stand in this visible unity and we fight against the invisible divisiveness that often plagues us. We thank you for coming. Thank you for sponsoring. Thank you for attending. And have a great one hour. smaller just because of the sense of community that we have in this room this morning. I'm truly inspired by the work of the leaders in our community, like the ones who we are honoring today, and I'm also filled with a renewed sense of purpose as I take the time each year to reflect on the incredible work of Dr. King. It's also my fourth year as a member of the Board of Trustees of Virginia Union, and I continue to be energized by the great work that Union does both on campus and throughout the Richmond region. It's also an honor to be with so many distinguished guests and speakers who join me up here today. This morning, I'd like to share some words from Dr. King's Street Sweeper speech about the three dimensions of a complete life that he delivered in Chicago less than a year before his death. The first dimension is the length of life. It's the inward concern for your own welfare. Dr. King tells us that we should all strive to be the best at whatever we do. In his most famous passage, Dr. King tells us that if we are a street sweeper, we should sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Handel and Beethoven composed music, and like Shakespeare wrote poetry. All of our life's work matters. But Dr. King tells us we must pursue deeper meaning through the second dimension of life that he calls the breadth of life, the outward concern for the welfare of others. In order to truly live a meaningful life, we must dedicate ourselves to the broader concerns of all humanity. 
There is nothing greater in life, Dr. King tells us, than to do something for others. He then implores us to go further and look higher. The third dimension, the height of life, is the upward reach for the universal. As a man of deep faith, Dr. King, of course, was talking about God. We can all answer Dr. King's call to extend the reach of our lives beyond earthly concerns and dedicate ourselves to something more universal. As academics, we must pursue knowledge and truth. As public officials, we must pursue justice and equality. And as leaders, we must be careful stewards of the environment. These are all universal pursuits and in my view are reflections of the divine power Dr. King beckons us to reach for. For me, this event represents the celebration of his legacy through those honored here today who have put all of these three dimensions together and therefore, as Dr. King tells us, walk and never get weary. It's what his legacy and this event are all about, and I'm incredibly honored to share it with you this morning. Thank you. To introduce, to introduce our keynote speaker, Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. President Lucas, Dr. Richardson, Governor Northern, Mayor Stoney, to the mistress of ceremony, colleagues, elected officials, and others, other distinguished guests at this historic event, this community leaders breakfast. As we gather this morning to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am reminded of his life and legacy as a drum major for justice. Dr. King led by example and always asked the question, what are you doing for others? Our keynote speaker this morning has committed her life to the spirit of Dr. King's example of leadership. She has worked tirelessly to honor the dream of Dr. King and to create a colorblind society that embraces equality and justice for all men and women. I could give you a long list of her academic and professional accomplishments. However, I would like to focus on her from a personal perspective. She's a wonderful wife and a loving mother, a well-respected attorney, legislator, and a dedicated and committed American public servant. She has graciously agreed to help me in the past as we co-chaired the Richmond branch of NAACP 100th anniversary at the Freedom Fund Gala. She also helped me to celebrate the first annual commemoration of I Am My Brothers and Sisters Keepers Day, where we engaged in an interfaith gathering at the Richmond Reconciliation Statue and walk together to the Holocaust Museum for meaningful fellowship and dialogue. She is a phenomenal woman who has not been afraid to put her hands to the plow and to get the work done. During 2019, she traveled all over the Commonwealth and country to raise money and then support to our Democratic candidates to ensure a historic democratic victory for the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's right. Thank you. Now, after 400 years of the oldest body of legislative, legislation called the General Assembly in Virginia, she has earned the honor of being our first woman and the first Jewish speaker of the House of Delegates for the great Commonwealth of Virginia. in her nine days of groundbreaking leadership, she has placed historically underrepresented people in leadership roles as committee chairs in the Virginia House of Delegates and was very instrumental in getting 
the ERA finally passed in the state of Virginia. She is a trusted colleague. She is my good friend. And at this time, I am honored to introduce to some and to present to others the Honorable Arlene Philicon, the Speaker of the House of Commonwealth of Virginia. it is for me to be here today and thank you so much to my good friend, Delegate Chair Dolores McGuinn. This morning we're, we're here together to, to honor somebody and to also share with you about what we here in the General Assembly can do to ensure that we continue to build a more inclusive and a more equitable Virginia. And we're also honoring so many who have for years worked hard, diligently, to move the Commonwealth and the country forward. And few have battled longer and harder and more relentless than my friend Dolores McQuinn. Here at Year after year, you and I all know Delegate McQuinn has fought tirelessly to make sure that all Virginians are treated equally. No matter the color of their skin, the religion they practice or don't, who they are, their gender, or who they love. And while some have fought Delegate McQuinn and her efforts to ensure comprehensive and anti-discrimination reform, Delegate McQuinn never, ever wavered. She never gave up. And this year, this session, this majority, Delegate McQuinn's vision to eliminate discrimination in housing, in employment, and public accommodation will come to fruition. <laughs> this perseverance and this commitment is why we all love and respect Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Dolores, thank you for your commitment, for your hard work, for your dedication, for the introduction, and most importantly, for your friendship. I am delighted to see Governor Ralph Northam with us today, and thank you, Governor, for all that you have done and continue to do to ensure that Virginia is a more equitable place to live, to work, to raise a family. And it's my great honor to work with you and your fabulous team as we continue to move the Commonwealth forward. And thank you, President Hakeem Lucas, Chairman Franklin Richardson, and Virginia Union for having us all here for the 42nd of this important gathering. I also would like to congratulate the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus this morning. Later, they'll be receiving Virginia Union's 2020 Martin Luther King Award for their civic leadership. And thank you to my friends, Chair Lamont Bagby, Vice Chair Jennifer McClellan, and so many others all that you, for all that you do in the Legislative Black Caucus to ensure that our Commonwealth is a better place for all Virginians. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, the inspiration for our assembly today, would have turned 91 years old on Wednesday. And while Dr. King was taken from us far too soon, far too young, his words, his wisdom, and his vision are truly timeless. It was Dr. King who said, quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In Virginia, this moral has indeed been very long. Our Commonwealth has had some very high highs and some very low lows. This legislative session, we are looking to heed Dr. King's words and truly taking action to bend the, our more, to bend our moral art in the Commonwealth of Virginia sharply towards justice. <laughs> we have a unique opportunity to correct course on so many injustices of the Commonwealth's past and to create a safer, a more inclusive, more prosperous Commonwealth for all of our citizens. 
For starters, starters, this General Assembly and its leadership will look more like the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have the first woman and person of color to serve as the House Majority Leader in Virginia's history, my friend and yours, Charnel Herring. We have the first person of, person, woman and person of color to serve as President Pro Tem of the Virginia Senate in Louise Lucas. For the first time, we will have women of color lead committees in the House of Delegates, part of the most diverse group of House Committee Chairs and Vice Chairs we have ever had, including Chair Dolores McGuinn. And yes, it is my great privilege to serve as the first woman speaker of the Commonwealth's history. Not only will our leadership reflect a more open and welcoming and equal Virginia, we will take action to ensure that our Commonwealth is more just. This session, we are going to make meaningful and lasting changes to Virginia's criminal justice system. For far too long, wealthy and well-connected communities in the Commonwealth have received better treatment under the law than those in lower income and minority communities. That is why we must dedicate ourselves to creating a fairer criminal justice system in Virginia that reduces the problem of over-incarceration and criminalization of poverty. Far too many of our children are being taken out of the classroom for long periods of time as a result of onerous school discipline. And no surprise, the education growth of these students of color are disproportionately harmed by these punishment practices. We all know it is much cheaper to provide education and support than to house prisoners. We must and we will put an end to the school to prison pipeline in the Commonwealth of the Union. This year, we will not only make our criminal justice system fairer, but also our democracy. In a 1957 address from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, titled, quote, Give Us Ballot, Dr. King said that, quote, So long as I do not firmly and irrevocably possess the right to vote, I do not possess myself. I cannot make up my mind. It is made up for me. I cannot live as a democratic citizen, observing the laws that I have helped to enact. I can only submit to the edict of others." End quote. Those words and that spirit must guide us this session. There is nothing more fundamental to the country than the right of citizens to elect their leaders. This session we must and we will expand the right to vote in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes, we will get rid of Virginia's voter ID law. The census restriction was put in our code to solely restrict communities of color from access to the ballot. It is a new day in Virginia, and we are committed to taking this onerous law off the books. Both in Virginia's parents and the elderly who cannot make it to the polls on election day should not be scrutinized nor punished. They should be encouraged to vote. This session, we will ensure that Virginians have 45 days of no excuse absentee voting. We will also pass legislation that makes election day a state holiday. Even better, we will do this in conjunction with repealing Lee Jackson Day in the Commonwealth. More Virginians participating in our democracy will make the Commonwealth stronger. And while we ensure that every Virginian has the time to cast their vote, we will also end the practice of honoring two men Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, who stood against everything we here in this room represent. We will take these
measures and more to minimize restrictions and increase access so that all Virginians can, as Dr. King said, firmly and irrevocably take part in the democratic process. Thank you to everyone in this room for what you do to make sure that our Commonwealth is stronger. From my friend Delegate Dolores McQuinn, to President Lucas, to Chairman Richardson, to Governor Northam, to Chair Bagby, to Vice Chair McClellan and the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, and so many of you here today that have long honored Dr. King by helping our Commonwealth and our nation lead forward by constantly working to make our communities more just and more equal. But we all know that we cannot rest. There is much work to do. Dr. King put it best, quote, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. <clears throat> here of the unique opportunity to fly. We can, and I promise you that this session, we will fly and we will make historic progress in Virginia. I look forward to continuing to partner with you all to ensure that we act swiftly and decisively moving our Commonwealth forward. Thank you for the honor to be here today. Because we know that while laws change, their devastating impacts do not disappear overnight. By appointing the first chief diversity officer, I believe the first in the country, by introducing one of the boldest budgets that makes historic investments in preserving African American history and eliminating the disparity in maternal mortality rates. I could go on and on, but Speaker Philip Horne has pretty much outlined the agenda we're going to implement this year. It is my pleasure to welcome Governor Northam. Well, good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year. Thank you, Senator McClellan, for the kind introduction and also thank you for your leadership uh, in the Senate and all that you do for our great Commonwealth. It is it's great to be back here at the annual breakfast and I, I know that you all want to leave by 8.30 but they said that I had a couple hours so please uh, make yourself comfortable this morning. But you know I have gone to this breakfast for a number of years and it's just wonderful to see how it has grown and that just speaks to the power of Virginia Uni Universe and, and your leadership. So thank you. It's also great to see all of our elected officials. I, it's impossible to, uh, to recognize all of them. I know our Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax is with us this morning. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Members of Congress, our delegates and senators, thank you all so much. I know it is a very busy time of year uh, and for you to be here means a lot, I know, to all of us, to, especially to uh, Virginia Union. And I also want to thank all of you for your continued to support of our historically black colleges and universities. That is, this is going to be a big year uh, for us. So thank you for that. Dr. Lucas, again, thank you for 
your leadership. I have gotten to know Dr. Lucas uh, well over the last couple of years, and I am glad to call you a friend. Uh, I appreciate all that he is doing uh, at Virginia Union. And I have visited Virginia Union several times in the past few years, and I am always impressed at how hard your school works to prepare its students to go out into the world and have just a tremendous impact. So congratulations to you for, for all that you do. And speaking of a lot of Panthers that are doing good things uh, in our uh, world, if you will, uh, my pastor uh, over on the Eastern Shore of Virginia, uh, First uh, Baptist in Cadeville, uh, is the Reverend Kelvin Jones, who was with us last year. He's not here today, but uh, he is a, a graduate uh, of 2004 of Virginia Union. So uh, thank you for uh, letting us have him on the Eastern Shore. And, and speaking of Panthers, and I, I don't want to give away all my secrets, and Ken Johnson, I see you sitting in the audience, so what I'm getting ready to say really needs to stay in the house here today. But, you know, so, uh, it was mentioned that there's a basketball game uh, on, on Saturday. We also have a basketball game uh, on February the 20th, and, and our team, the, the governor's team, will play the, the lobbyist. And, um, I just wanted to let you all know that our, our starting center uh, this year, it's not me, uh, uh, I'm 6'2", but uh, our starting center is 6'9". Uh, he graduated uh, from Virginia Union in 1996. He, he wears the number six uh, on his jersey. He also played for the Detroit Pistons, uh, none other than Ben Wallace, who uh, will be on my team. And as you, as you can tell, we plan to win. <laughs> but it is an honor to be here with you this morning as we remember the important legacy of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. As you all know, Dr. King visited Virginia Union many times to teach and speak. And among other things, he inspired the Richmond 34 to hold their sitting at Tallheimer's lunch counter that eventually resulted in the desegregation of that store and other department stores. I have been privileged over the past year to get to know some of the members of the Richmond 24, and I have had the opportunity to thank them for their courage. Dr. King taught them and taught us all to meet violence with peace and hate with love. And that can be hard to do sometimes. It seems especially hard for people these days. We have so much going on at the national level and in our state and in our communities. People seem to be increasingly divided from one another. We mistrust our neighbors who believe differently than we do. And we are increasingly angry at each other. But this is no way to be. This is not good for our country, our communities, or ourselves. And it's not how we want our children to grow up. So I hope that we can get back to treating each other with respect and civility and with compassion. I hope we can remember to treat others as we would want to be treated. Dr. King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I hope we can remember his lessons, not just one day a year, but all of the, all of the days. I believe it is important to make sure that everyone understands what Dr. King was fighting against, the deep-rooted discrimination and oppression that he and so many others, like the Richmond 24, were working to overturn. We must make sure we're telling the full and true story of that history, from slavery through Reconstruction and the terrors of the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights Movement. And we must realize that black oppression continues today just in a different form, and we must work to address it. I am committed to doing all I can to ensure that we're telling the story comprehensively. Over the past year, 
I have met with people around the state and listened to their views on the disparities and inequities that still exist today. I have had to personally confront some painful truths. Among those truths was my own incomplete understanding regarding race and equity. Dr. King spoke of measuring a man by where he stands, not in moments of comfort and convenience, but at times of challenge and controversy. And those truths were not comfortable for me. I have learned a great deal from our discussions, and I continue to learn. And I also learned that the more I know, the more I can do. There remain steps that we can take at the state level to start to right wrongs of the past and to make our systems more equitable. A first was to hire Dr. Janice Underwood as Virginia's first diversity officer. I don't think any other state has someone in this kind of a role, and trust me, she has hit the ground running. Dr. Underwood is working to help lead equity initiatives and legislation across our administration and in our state agencies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Janice Underwood. Janice, please thank you. Last summer, we created the Commission on African American History Education. This commission will work to improve the way we teach African American history and ensure that all of our students have a better, more comprehensive understanding of Virginia's past. We also created the commission to examine racial inequality in Virginia law because we knew that some of the discriminatory language from our past remained on our books. That commission has identified around 100 instances of language to remove. That includes laws banning school integration, prohibiting black and white Virginians from living in the same neighborhoods, and prohibiting interracial marriage, still on our books. And we have legislation in this current General Assembly to remove that language because words matter and so does action. We are working to improve the diversity of our state contracting and support more women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses. My budget invests nearly $22 million <clears throat> over two years to combat maternal and infant mortality and reduce the racial disparity in Virginia's maternal mortality rate. We're also putting more money into educational programs to help at-risk students succeed. I am hopeful that after this session, all three and four-year-olds will have better access to early childhood education. We have proposed additional funding for our historic African American cemeteries to ensure that they are treated with the dignity and respect <clears throat> excuse me, that they deserve. We're going to restore the Green Pastures Recreation Area, once a segregated park. We must use all tools at our disposal to better tell the stories of underrepresented people, including our historic highway markers. I'm proposing legislation to give localities control over the Confederate memorials in their towns. Those monuments commemorate a cause that is truly more lost every day. And we are working to improve economic opportunity for all. Businesses tell me all the time that they want to come to Virginia. They want to make sure we have the workforce pipeline that they need. I appreciate the work that Virginia Union does to provide an excellent education to its students, especially in STEM-related fields. We know that many 21st century jobs depend on these science and technology skills. Virginia Union is building the Classroom to Career Pipeline to help its graduates get good jobs. They're also providing important internship opportunities and other ways students can get real-world career experiences. 
Monday is the state and federal holiday that honors Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his legacy. We will mark that day here in Virginia by declaring it Martin Luther King Jr. Day, honoring his work as a drum major for justice. Also on that day, as you may have heard, we are expecting large crowds to visit our capital to express their views on legislation. That is a fundamental right. But I also hope and expect that they will take a page from Dr. King's example of nonviolent protest. Dr. King spoke of resolving conflict through love, and that is the best way that we can honor his legacy every day of the year. Thank you all so much, and God bless you. of the Civil War, a new constitution took effect in Virginia. One of the important milestones was it established for the first time a system of free public education in Virginia. 22 of the members of that constitutional convention were African American men. Today, it is my pleasure to ask to stand and be recognized the current chair of the House of Representatives Education Com uh, Committee, our own Congressman Bobby Sky. He's also joined by Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger. Each year at this breakfast, we recognize the life work of community leaders and game changers from our Commonwealth. This year, we recognize 23 people who reflect the principles that emulate what Dr. King lived and died for throughout his short life. Also 150 years ago, the first African American men began their service in the General Assembly. 21 in the House, 6 in the Senate. 35 years ago this year, the first African-American woman, Yvonne Miller, began her service in the House of Delegates. I'm proud to be a member of the caucus that continues their legacy. And today, the 2020 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Civic Engagement goes to each member of the Legislative Black Caucus. The Virginia Legislative Black Caucus was formed uh, back in the early 70s. A lot of the individuals remember back when Doug Wilder and others first came into the legislature, there were no other people of color at all. And so they formed the Legislative Black Caucus so that they could have individuals of like minds to caucus together to talk about the concerns of the day. The Black Caucus has been, for the last 40 years, has been the conscience of the Commonwealth's legislature. And so we are focused on all those things that are important to those individuals that live at the margins, below the margins, at every corner of the Commonwealth, making sure that it's fair criminal justice reform. We fought hard for Medicaid expansion to make sure the individuals are uh, receiving proper health care, uh, even those that can't afford it. Uh, we're, we're making sure that schools are adequately funded, particularly those schools that are at risk. Uh, and so we've been really, really focused on those types of issues. Uh, evictions has been at the top of our list the last couple of years as we've seen uh, the Commonwealth lead in, in a space that we don't want to be leading, and that is in evictions and those individuals that don't, don't have permanent home. Focusing in on, on Dr. King's legacy means a great deal to us uh, as we pause during the legislature uh, to recognize his contributions. Uh, we're still working on some of the things that he worked on. We're still working on those things today. Uh, we're fighting right now to raise the minimum wage, which he was focused on in his last days. 
Uh, we hope to raise it to $15 per hour, uh, but it has not been raised in well over a decade. I'm so excited that seven out of the 14 uh, committees in the House of Delegates are chaired by, will be chaired by uh, black caucus members. Uh, all these individuals have, have come here thinking about the legacy before us, working on the issues that have been worked on for, for, for many decades. Uh, as we look at 400 years uh, of African Americans in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, that in itself uh, is a lot to think about. This is the first time in the history of the Commonwealth in which African Americans will be leading the way. Uh, we have appropriations where we focus on, in on not only fully funding our pre-K uh, through 12 schools, but also our higher ed, not only our private, but also our public. And so Luke Torrance is gonna lead the way in making sure that our HBCUs get fully funded uh, and adequately, adequately funded. Uh, we also increasing the number of, of school counselors in our schools to make sure that those ratios are appropriate. The Community Leaders Breakfast is not only important because it honors the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but it also offers an opportunity for us to continue to build as community leaders. This is where individuals go, not only uh, to celebrate the legacy, but also to build with one another. I mean, we oftentimes don't see each other uh, all together in one room uh, until this breakfast. And so um, the energy in the room for the breakfast is always, uh, in my opinion, really inspiring. Uh, just to have so much wealth of knowledge and wealth of passion uh, for the issues that we fight for day to day in one room. And so even though it's a dorm session, members of the General Assembly very seldom miss the breakfast because it's so important. Uh, and so I'm so grateful uh, that we are still working on this is these issues and I think we're really gonna make a lot uh, 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 have a lot of progress this session. Uh, and so thank you all for supporting us. Delegate LaCherie's Eric Petersburg, Delegate Hala Ayala, Prince William, Delegate Lamont Bagby, Henrico, Delegate Jeff Bourne, Richmond, Delegate Jennifer Carroll Ford, Prince William County, Delegate Cliff Hayes, Chesapeake, Majority Leader Shawnell Herring, Alexandria, Delegate Jay Jones, Norfolk, Senate Majority Leader Mamie Locke, Hampton, Senate President Pro Tem, Louise Lucas, Portsmouth, Senator Jennifer McClellan, Richmond, Chair of House Transportation, Dolores McQueen, Richmond, Delegate Marcia Price, Newport News, Delegate Sam Rasul, Roanoke, Senate Majority Whip, Lionel Spruill, Chesapeake, Chair of House Appropriations, Luke Torian, Prince William County, Chair of House Education, Ross Tyler, Sussex, Chair of Commerce and Labor, Jawan Ward, Hampton, Delegate Josh Cole, Prince William County, Delegate Alex Askew, Virginia Beach, Delegate Don Scott Portsmouth, Joe Lindsay, Chair of Privileges and Elections, Norfolk, Delegate Clinton Jenkins, Suffolk, Ladies and gentlemen, please give another round of applause for our honorees, the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. We appreciate their leadership and their service. Good morning. Good morning. I almost said good morning, this branch of Zion. Uh, but good morning, and I do want to say uh, glory to God for for all these faces that he has assembled in his place today. Uh, glory to God for what he has been able to force us to do as it relates to advocating for our communities. And glory to God for Virginia Union University, its president, and Dr. Richardson. Uh, thank you all for honoring us this morning. It feels like the BET Awards. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, I made it. But you know, when I first came into the door and, and, and 
Last year, around this time, I got a little emotional on the floor uh, talking about those individuals that uh, came before us. And when I came through the door, I saw Frank Thornton, who was the first African-American to serve uh, in Henrico County. <laughs> then I looked the other way, and I saw a guy I've been trying to chase down the mayor and I've been trying to take Henry Marsh out to lunch for about three months now. So I saw Henry Mar Marsh, and he said, <laughs> he said to, to me, job well done. And you don't know what that did to me. Then I saw, we call him Uncle Bobby. <laughs> we saw Congressman Bobby Scott. You're not going to fall. <laughs> and then our former legislative Black Caucus chair, uh, Dwight Clinton Jones. who still makes its way up to the General Assembly saying he wants more money for HBCUs, <laughs> just last week. Uh, and I heard my buddy Donald McEachin was here. I haven't seen him yet. But we stand on the shoulders of a lot of individuals that have served before us. And one thing that you, I, I respect about Dr. Martin Luther King was he empowered others. So even after his death, so many of the individuals that st served alongside him were able to lead on their own accord. And that's the same legacy we want in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. The same issues that he was fighting for then, we're fighting for now. And I'm so glad, uh, Governor, that you put so much money in, uh, in your budget for HBCUs. Where's Dr. Abdullah? I thought he was here. I think he's happy. <laughs> but again, thank you all so much uh, for encouraging us, for supporting us. We're at these record numbers uh, as a caucus because of you. You all are the ones that support us financially and at the ballot box. And so rest assured that we will not let you down. We will keep our promises. And thank you all for this honor. We hope you are enjoying the breakfast this morning, but it is only one of many events over the weekend that will celebrate Dr. King's life and legacy. And I'd like to invite you to attend an event tomorrow co-hosted by the state's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Commission and Virginia University at the Alex B. James Chapel uh, inside Coburn Hall. We are screening a documentary and, discussion, and having a discussion of the HBCU Storyteller Project's docuseries, 400 Years Free-ish. The documentary filmmakers include students from here. It tells the story of a monument that the commission is building to honor, to celebrate emancipation and freedom, but recognizing emancipation was not a moment, but a process and that freedom was a long journey we are still working on. We will honor 10 African-American Virginians, five who fought against slavery, and five who fought for equality and justice after the Civil War, including Virginia Union's own Wyatt T. Walker. <laughs> but monuments cost money, so while the screening is free for students, Tickets are $25. We have sponsorships of many levels. If you are interested, let me know. And we welcome you to come and watch that screening tomorrow. For more information, you can contact Lily Jones, who is here, uh, or you can reach her at ljones at dls.virginia.gov to reserve your tickets. I want to thank all of our sponsors here today. And in just a few moments, we will hear remarks from our mayor, LeVar Stoney, 
followed by announcements from Reverend Ricardo Brown, the co-pastor of Fifth Baptist Church and executive director of Living the Dream. We will then have a special presentation by CBS 6, and Reverend Brown will give our introduction. But first, I want to thank you all for your attendance today. Please leave here understanding our work is not done. The arc of the moral universe needs help bending towards justice from each of us. We have not yet achieved Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. The threats we face this weekend and as we go to work on Monday show that. But just like Dr. King knew that what he was doing caused people to hate him and want to stop him, we know that too. We will not be deterred. We will continue to fight to make his dream a reality here in the Commonwealth of Virginia and beyond. I also want to thank you for remembering Virginia Union University and supporting their endeavors to educate and provide a future that is lemonless. Mayor Stoning. Well, thank you, Senator, and good morning, everyone. I want to begin by also thanking President Lucas and Dr. Richardson for their leadership and also for this event, which aids a great institution and commemorates a great American. As mayor, I welcome you all to the great city of Richmond, the diverse, inclusive, and thriving capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a welcoming city where we strive every day to live out the ideals and to realize the dreams of Dr. King. I've often said Richmond's history has parts good, parts bad, and parts ugly. But its future will be defined by good people and their commitment to the message of Dr. King of hope, unity, and love. Over the years, our faith has certainly been tested. And it may well be tested again in a few days. And so I want you to know that although we will protect the First Amendment rights of each and every one, that our priority is the life and property of Richmonders come Monday. Today, I think is hel it's helpful to remember that it was Dr. King who told us to be loving enough to absorb evil and understanding enough to turn an enemy into a friend. It was Dr. King who told us to pray for the oppressor and use moral and spiritual force to carry on the struggle for justice. And it was Dr. King who told us not to be afraid to try new ways to achieve healing reconciliation, and social change. Dr. King gave his life for those things. The least we can do in his name is to lend our ears, to listen, and to continue to understand. To lend our hearts, to lift others up with compassion, and to lend our voices to the cores of our fellow men and women who need and deserve our support in these trying times because they are standing up for what is right, even when it's not easy and even when it poses risk. To, that is why it is both fitting, I think, and appropriate that we just recognized and honored today's awardees, the Legislative Black Caucus, who have kept the faith, had resilience to keep fighting when they were outnumbered and who have demonstrated the courage to take action now that they have the chance to improve the lives of all Virginians. This, my friends, is our charge, and this, my friends, is our duty. Service, not silence. Action, speaking louder than words, not just one day out of the year, but each and every day of the year. That is why Martin Luther King Jr. Day, unlike many other holidays we celebrate, is less about vacation and more about vocation. Less about sales and more about service. It is not a day off, it is a day on. Ladies and gentlemen, service to others isn't a nine to five job, it's a 24 seven sort of thing. Lifting someone up isn't an I'll be there later thing, it's a I'm coming right now thing. Simply put, doing the right thing never takes a day off. See, VUU, Virginia Union University, knows this because Virginia Union University lives 
this. That's why you're here, and that's why I'm humbled and honored to be here with you today and working with you side by side in service to live out the dreams of Dr. Martin Luther King envisioned. Lastly, I would be remiss to not recognize there will be a basketball game played 21 miles away at the Virginia State University Multipurpose Center. But all I gotta say as I end here is, wouldn't it be great for the city of Richmond to host the CIAA again? <laughs> Need I not say more? I don't think that was in his manuscript. <laughs> All right, we gotta go. We gotta go. Will the members of Living the Dream and the State King Commission please stand? Will you please stand? King Commission as well as Living the Dream. Thank you. Thank you. On Monday at the 6th Baptist Church, where Reverend Yvonne Bibbs is the pastor. We will honor students in our public school system and Mrs. Charmaine Crowell White, a retired teacher from Chesterfield County, will do a one-woman show, Harriet Tubman, on Monday at 10 a.m. at the Sixth Baptist Church. I wanted to let you know that the honoree that Channel 6 was going to honor is not here. So um, that will not take place. Please stand for the benediction. God bless us and God keep us as we leave this place to go out and serve. Amen. Thank you all and have a great MLK weekend.